we've had plenty of time. We've had plenty of time. They can get caught down for So, um, our first talk is uh, Julian Krolik, Hydrodynamics and Photon Emission from Gas, very near Black Hole Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to begin with a small apology. First, um, there are a number of people in this audience who were at the Aspen workshop in February who already heard part of this talk. Um, so you can, you can uh, see whether it matches your recollections. Um, and to all of the audience, In contrast to the style of yes, most of yesterday's talk, this will not be entirely a general review. I'll present some overview and some sort of big picture discussion, but I'll also focus on a particular segment of the subject that I think has received relatively little attention. And I'll excuse myself for this focus um, by the fact that there are, the remainder of the subject has actually been divided over, I believe, three other talks um, over the next couple of days. And so the other pieces will get filled in. Uh, okay. So um, all of you are well aware of the wonderful triumph of numerical relativity five, six years ago. Um, we now actually solve the problem of a pair of black holes merging in vacuum, at least with the mass ratio is not too extreme. And of course, there are all the wonderful um, calculations of detailed waveforms to be produced in gravitational waves. That's a wonderful success. But theory does connect to observations. And although we all may look forward to seeing LISA eventually built and launched and operating, um, it's a ways off. <coughs> and um, depends on your patience, 15 years to me is a very long time. So there's a, another way to look at this whole subject, and that is, as a great mix of, I think a great many of you are well aware, although it would you know, make every sense in the world to treat the initial problem as one in vacuum, astrophysical black holes live in gas. And gas has the um, very great ability to radiate photons, and we have all these telescopes that work on photons and are extremely well developed with terrifically sensitive instruments and perhaps we can actually see some of these events even before in photons, even before we see them in gravitational waves. And that way we won't have to get old and grayer um, before we actually see black hole mergers directly. Now there are a number of opportunities to do this. Um, which uh, you can divide up as the sort of prologue on route to the merger, and what you might call in recovery afterwards as the system relaxes. Uh, the story could begin with presumably two large black holes in a single galaxy, perhaps neither one of them in the nucleus. This is the state that um, I, believe, I think Monica maybe has priority on the term dual for a pair of black holes in a galaxy, but not bound to one another, not yet. And at some stage in the development, as they move closer to the center, they may acquire a, an orbiting disk of gas surrounding the binary pair. And this may provide an aid to compressing the orbit. It may also provide um, a kind of screen on which, uh, from what there may be light produced, and we can detect something of this run-up toward the merger. That's still very speculative. Again, well, you'll, that's one of the areas you'll hear more about over the next couple of days. Um, it's possible that another EM signature may come from AGN activity by perhaps one, perhaps both of these AGNs. That's unclear. The dynamics of accretion onto either black holes orbiting at some distance out in the galaxy or in an actual bound, bound binary near the center has not been well worked out. And we really don't know yet, although it's sometimes tacitly assumed, whether these black holes would appear as you know, 0, 1, or 2 AGNs. Another 
possibility is that particularly once the uh, anyway, binary has been formed, that it can interact with individual stars just dynamically and create special features in the kinematics of the stars in the galaxy. That's another signature that might be searched for. It's a little bit more indirect than um, conceivable. Afterward, any surrounding gas is likely going to be heated through at least two processes. One of them is characteristically, um, there is a recoil of the merged black hole of anywhere from a few hundred to perhaps you know, very special alignments up to a few thousand kilometers per second, and that can draw shocks into surrounding gas, heat it, and radiate. Likewise, of course, the energy law in gravitational waves that just a few percent of the mass almost instantaneously change the potential on the orbital time scale of this and it needs to adjust to that. Um, again, you'll hear more about that from other speakers. Um, just, if the merged black hole can actually hold on to a significant amount of orbiting gas, and that's another large if, that might accrete in quasi-steady fashion onto that um, now single black hole and perform as an AGN. And how long that lasts, of course, depends on how much mass and likewise, there are um, possible for it to also hold on to nearby stars well, it's, um, on the same kind of criteria. <coughs> All those have received some treatment, but there's a particular point which I think is especially interesting, which has received relatively little, and that is the moment of the merger itself. day or two from uh, Mara Bogdanovich about uh, some simulations of this topic. What I want to spend my time on this morning is giving a kind of um, order of magnitude analysis of what the important issues are, in part so we can understand the context of more detailed calculations, in part also because the state of the art of global simulations these days does not include radiation transfer. And in this part of the problem, and perhaps in some of the others as well, I believe transfer is actually um, there at a sort of zero order level as one of the controlling factors in determining the character of the electromagnetic output. And so the best we can do at the moment is these simple um, order of magnitude analytic arguments. So just to get a sense of the scale, uh, you're expecting in the universe something in order one for each one large <coughs> length of the Earth. They're, of course, hugely luminous in gravitational waves for not very long. And now, just how much mass might there be, um, a few tens of gravitational radii, from the merging object? That is extremely uncertain. Uh, there are reasonable guesses people have made that span many, many orders of magnitude. And the point that I want to make here is, uh, first, that even for gas that is, only, uh, that is already optically fixed constant scattering, the amount of mass that you need close by to do that is very small. 10 to the minus 8 solar masses is a trace. And so even if there are a great many difficulties in getting gas that close to the center, um, it doesn't take much to be interested. Let me expand on why I gave a triple question mark the amount of gas mass. Well, the first question, of course, is what the external supply rate. We don't understand that in ordinary AGN sitting quietly at the center of the galaxy. They shine, they measure the luminosity, and nobody really knows what controls how much gas is fed for how long In the case of a merger, well, of course, you know, doubly underline the, um, the ignorance. And so one could imagine mass supply rates, supply rates anywhere from sort of AGN level, you know, maybe solar masses per year, in a variety of cases, down to the, oh, you know, what is it? I think the latest estimate for a galactic center is something like 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. It's a fairly wide possible range. If 
you believe that black hole mergers are in fact the fairly rapid product of galaxy mergers, and if you believe galaxy mergers and gastric galaxies lead to strong inflows, which is possible in many simulations show, then the accretion rate might be relatively large, but that's a very uncertain thing. The next is that if you place a binary inside a disk, the very fact that it's binary tends to retard the inflow. Binaries are very effective at exerting upward torques on gas up to a few times the semi-major axis of the binary, and gas may come in on the outside, but tends to tie it up at a, you know, two or three times that semi-major axis. And that can be an advantage if the gas is receiving angular momentum and getting it from the orbit, and that can help solve the compression problem that's been pointed out by, uh, take about five minutes to list all the authors of the various papers on the subject, and Gould and Rich make them look very accurate. Um, uh, so that may be a good thing. At the same time, <coughs> the process of torquing the outside gas and holding it back is unlikely to be perfect. It's hard to imagine that the gravitational torques can build a wall that is 99.99% leak free. And because, as I've already pointed out, it doesn't take much gas at the center to be interesting, it matters whether the leakage is a factor of two, a factor of 100, a factor of 10,000. That's going to be a significant number to calculate, and we don't yet know. And of course, likely to depend on a number of parameters, um, notably the mass ratio of the binary. And there, of course, is another aspect here in which I raised a question earlier whether the zero, one, or two of the black holes would turn on as AGMs. That depends on how much they can capture from this inflow, and that too depends on the details of the dynamics of the mass ratio. As I think uh, Milos Alievich and Finney were the first to point out, there eventually comes a stage in the compression of the binary when they're close enough that the rapidly accelerating loss of energy from gravitational radiation pulls the binary in tighter and faster than the characteristic inflow time of the gas due to its own internally generated stresses. And so they argued that, in fact, very little gas would get right in close to the center because it couldn't keep up. But once again, there's this question of leakage. The, and in particular, the theory on which basically all of these calculations have been based is the ancient phenomenological Shakura Sinyaev model, in which the internal stress is supposed to be some no constant number times the total pressure. Over the, well, since the early 1990s, and work of Steve Aldous and John Pauly, we've learned that the real physical mechanism of angular momentum transport in disks is MHD turbulence. And if you go to the middle of the disk, and you vertically integrate, and you azimuthally average, and you take very long time averages, roughly speaking, there is a proportionality between the stress and the intrinsic pressure. But there's no particular reason to suppose, you know, there are lots of fluctuations and so on, but in addition, there's no particular reason to suppose that when you go near the edge of the disk, where things are no longer in this nice, regular, steady situation, that there'd be any particular tie between pressure and stress at all. And so that's why it's going to be very important to answer this, or to answer this question, to introduce the real physical mechanism, the real MHD stressor, and that is still very much in its infancy. And all that leads to the last question about the gas mass, which is, if there is any close by, what is it doing? Is it orbiting in a flat disk? Is it in some hot, puffed up structure? We don't really know. What I'll assume for the purpose of this talk is the simplest default assumption, namely that it's in a cool, flattened orbiting disk. And the reason for that is partly, in some respects, it's the simplest assumption, and partly, as you'll see, it's the only one that offers any hope, I believe, for any significant electromagnetic display. Okay, so the solution to this conundrum of what in the world is the amount of gas close to the center, is just to say, let's stick in a number and see what the consequences are, and then we can be able to tell what the range of possibilities
standard comparison, <coughs> if you actually had a solitary single black hole center uh, treating at a fairly small fraction of anything, about 10 to the minus 3, then that would actually produce a Thompson depth of about 30,000 at 10 gravitational radii. And you recall that a Thompson depth of 1 on the first line is 10 to the minus 8 solar masses. It's a you know, huge 10 to the minus 4, so still pretty small. But also that even a fairly small accretion rate produces a large optical one. So what will happen to that gas? In the event of the merger itself, of course, there's drastic variation in the temporarily dynamical space-time. And the characteristic time scale of these, sort of you know, 10 by crossing time gravitational radius, is more or less on the dynamical time scale for orbiting gas about close in. In other words, you would expect particularly large effects. And this is not a true resonance, there's nothing periodic here. Um, but it's on the right time scale for being effective in driving large non-circular motions in the gas. And if that happens, and presumably it's going to very strongly from place to place, there should be shocks, presumably, on the orbital time scale. And of course, shocks need to heating. The amount of energy involved, I'll parameterize that as epsilon, but you might suppose at least you know, maximum it would be aborted the depth of potential, um, perhaps, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but perhaps get up somewhere close to that. Um, there's also a second source of energy that I think is probably secondary to the pure gravitational deflection, but could be interesting at some level, and that is that these same space-time fluctuations will create shears and stretches in the magnetic field embedded in the plasma, and that too can do work on gas. Lastly, while all this is going on, of course, some fraction of the gas that was there will get captured in a new merged system. And presumably, the closer in it was, the greater the probability. Now, to the degree that the deposition of heat in the gas is, in, is ultimately due entirely to gravitational dynamics, then the equivalence principle pretty much tells us that the total amount of energy deposited is just proportional to the total mass in the neighborhood. Which is very hard to get around. And now what that gives us, even sort of the brightest the system could possibly be, is to radiate this light in one dynamical time, the time it took to heat it. That gives a maximum luminosity per log radius of order to 10 to 44 ergs per second, scaling for an optical depth of 100, and central mass 10 to 6 solar masses. And the conclusion that you can draw from that is that this is sort of the minimum luminosity that you can readily pick up at high redshift, that the gas must be optically thick if it's going to be bright enough to see. It's possible that the amount of gas close in is so small that it's not optically thick. But if that's the case, the photons produced will be so negligible, we'll never see. Or at least not with maybe the telescopes that will come in um, coincident with second generation heat. Uh, it's hard to get away from this conclusion. Yes, that was meant to be a joke. <laughs> It's hard, I think, to get away from this conclusion that if there's enough gas mass to be bright, then it will be optically thick. Mm -hmm. So it could be tiny. I mean, it seems to me that there would be a truly tiny amount. If you think of the Thompson scale energy effectiveness, mm -hmm. you guess would be able to compete for a tiny amount of mass. But this is going to be truly tiny. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the less than a few little mass or a small fraction of the That's right. really, really tiny light. That's right. In fact, the estimate I made before is that <coughs> 100 would be about 10 to the minus 6 solar masses. Right, that's right. Yeah. That's like the Earth. That's like the Earth mass, if not. Yeah. Uh, also, it, it obviously you're saying it's no faster than a dynamical mass, but it's optically thick in terms of 100 or 1,000 or whatever. Next. 
several slides. So, yes. <laughs> this is just this is the brightest it can be. Okay. And the second point is, of course, if it's optically fit, yes, the signal will certainly be spread out over a longer period of time. And in addition, you can expect that whatever the initial photon production mechanism is, those photons will get modified as they make their way up through scattering and absorption and so on. So, what happens from at the start? How does, how does the gases create those photons? Well, there are a variety of mechanisms. Um, I think probably the fastest in these circumstances, particularly if the electrons <coughs> um, are relativistic, is some combination of synchrotron and inverse Compton scattering. And here, that would be quite rapid, rapid relative to the orbital time scale. Um, this quantity U is the energy density in either magnetic field or photon, synchrotron, inverse Compton. <coughs> and to the degree that it's comparable to the heat content of the gas, you can see the time scale is very short. And you can get, even if there's not much to begin with, you can get small population of seed photons from Bremsstrahlen, and then trigger a cascade and set the process off. So I think the most likely situation, particularly if there's much of an optical depth at all, is that very quickly the gas radiates the heat into photons, but then they must diffuse out, and that takes time. The cooling time in again, orbital units scales like this. The thickness of the disk relative to its radius, again, radius is um, gravitational units, and then the optical depth. And up here I'm scaling this optical depth of 100, so this could be a sizable factor. And the problem is, as I've emphasized at least five or six times now, <coughs> we don't know this number within many orders of magnitude. Okay. So how thick might it be? Well, that's actually rather simple. If the heating is comparable to the depth potential, then the gas is automatically thick. No way around that. And it really doesn't matter at this order of magnitude level whether it's held entirely in motions of the plasma or in photons. Provided it's optically thick, the photons are dynamically coupled to the plasma, it's effectively the same kind of pressure. So you expect a fairly thick configuration. And the cooling time is then just this. And it, to the degree that the optical depth is large, it is going to be large compared to an orbital period, large compared to a dynamical time. And so if there's enough gas to make a bright signal, its radiation is very unlikely to follow the details of the merger. It'll be caught for far longer than the merger event. Now, entertainingly, uh, the luminosity, when it's optically thick, is actually independent of the gas mass. And that's for a very simple reason, which is that the amount of energy is proportional to the gas mass. Its optical depth is also proportional to the gas mass. So it scales up. So the masses drop out. E over T is L. The mass drops out. There's a characteristic scale in the <coughs> by the opacity the optical depth per unit mass, and that's why it is always awarded the Eddington luminosity. If the principal opacity is, is constant. In these circumstances, I think it's good that. What does scale with the gas mass is how long it continues shining. Sorry, in that second expression, the epsilon, the efficiency at the rate of radiating the long radius, right. sort of drops as you go from the That's right. In an ordinary accretion disk, the cooling time is never longer than the inflow time. At most, they might be comparable. This situation is different because the heat that was injected into the gas didn't come from accretion. So it's a different dynamical relation. And green is a little bit um, uh, faded. The ratio
ratio of cooling time to inflow time scales the optical depth times that h over r, so basically affect ratio of q, and then our gravitation unit to the minus that half. So again, the degree is optically fixed. The cooling time might be long compared to inflow time, but this is h over r cubed, so it's a little, it's a little hard to say. If, it, if this is at all less than unity, it'll sort of counteract some of the optical depth. If that's so, the sort of direct signal may be prematurely cut off as the material accretes into the center trap of the photons. On the other hand, that process of accretion after the merger does run by the conventional dynamics of um, angular momentum transport and ultimate dissipation. And so there'd be additional heat injected and that would help continue the process. At that point, it's essentially making the transition towards steady state accretion a la the steady isolated EGN we're familiar with. Now, um, in what kind of telescope will we need to look for these? Because however long they may manage to continue to shine. If the energy were thermalized, the characteristic scale is soft x ray. Again, um, red shifted by wherever the, the system happens to be. Uh, but whether it really does manage to completely thermalize is, I think, chancing. There's some strong scalings here, kind of the three halves. If you, this is a sort of thermally average free free optical depth, if all these scaling factors were unity, it would not be fully thermalized. But an optical depth of 100 to 1,000 and a modest fractional <coughs> efficiency, and it would be thermal. So that's going to depend on details at this level of, of the argument. Can't really say. So it might be soft x-ray. It might be a broader, perhaps harder spectrum. And so let me finish up here. Very close to time. It's often been emphasized that the combination of the binary source and the rapid compression of the orbit you know, due to gravitational radiations at the end would mean that essentially no mass would and gas would get close to the merger. That may be true, but it takes not very much to be interesting. And so I think we're going to need to do better than the kind of hand-waving order of magnitude arguments that we info a stop and ask how thoroughly is it stopped. Second is that if there's going to be enough gas to do anything with, it's going to be optically thick. And so all these six electromagnetic signal calculations must include transfer. And that, of course, is the reason also why suppose that it was a cool, thin disk, because if it were in a hot, non-radiated state, well, the game's over in any case. Interestingly, in conditions where the capacity is dominated by tungsten scattering, which a million degree gas is pretty likely, there is a characteristic scale of the luminosity, and I think we will get that for binaries if there's enough gas to become optically thick. This is what I was stressing earlier, is that to really understand the structure of that gas, we will need to, under to deal with the radiation force. To the degree that the gas generates photons quickly on the dynamical time scale, the dominant force is supporting it against gravity in the um, near aftermath of the merger are going to be radiation forces. And so radiation transfer and radiation forces in the calculation will be essential. The duration of the, of the signal, I'm guessing here, or arguing, is going to be roughly proportional to the amount of gas supplied. But in our ignorance of how much that might be, be as short as the, well, as the time scale of the merger itself, perhaps minutes, or orders of magnitude longer. And obviously that has tremendous implications for our chances to actually spot this. Uh, and lastly, the part that is 
starting to be, I think, the hardest of these problems is actually predicting what the spectrum should look like, because that really will de depend on many detailed processes and will therefore come at the very end of the line of these calculations. Thank you. So, time for questions. Cole? So this is a very interesting treatment, and I enjoyed reading your, your paper on this. But I guess I, there, there'd be something, maybe, if you could pursue a little bit further. In terms of the effect of efficiency in which you're injecting energy into the system, um, as you know, uh, we did some simulations of what happens if you have a merger and then looking at the effect of the loss of mass from mm -hmm. existing in the form of gravitational waves as Bodhi and, and Finney have suggested. Mm -hmm. And the shocks actually do not inject that much energy into the system because we have a small centricity. And in fact, as you may remember, what we actually found is the primary effect is a decrease in the luminosity because the system expands yeah. so it's more yeah. efficient. Well, so I understand, but I think this is in a different regime. I'm looking at gas that's at tens of RG. Yeah. And so this is not a situation in which you have an essentially instantaneous <laughs> change in the potential which the gas slowly responds. This is a situation in which this gas is subject to the relatively large amplitude fluctuations associated with essentially the near field of the gravitational waves as they go out. And that's going to be not so, it's not nearly as symmetric as that you know, change to the point mass potential, and it's going to be much faster and is on the characteristic time scale of the motions themselves rather than essentially instantaneous. But, but you actually think that the gravitational waves can produce energy injections that are of a few percent of energy squared level? I, I don't quite understand how you're... So the, the Eddington argument you're making mm -hmm. does, does require that the effect of efficiency is you know, comparable to a... If it were 10 RG, it's comparable to 10 percent. Oh. And you're well, scaling then out. It's, well, the number times Eddington certainly depends on that. Yeah. That the Eddington is a characteristic scale is different, but there may be, you know, fact, factor is not so order unity in front of it. Well, but, but that's the question. Why couldn't it be affected much less than you? Oh. Oh, it certainly could be. But I would think that this close in is that where you're not talking, of, this is, in several respects, in a different regime in characteristic dimensionless numbers than the situation that you studied at much larger radius. And so there is at least the possibility of <coughs> much larger efficiency, because remember the scale here, it's on the scale of the wavelength of the waves. There will be spatial variation. And so I think that at least offers the possibility of larger effects. We actually did study it close in, not far away. But this close? But yeah. I don't recall that in the paper. Okay, we can talk about it. Okay. Was thinking, how do you exclude the possibility of fact that in such a optically thick medium you don't have photon trapping and so all the radiation would be eventually trapped in it. Oh, well in fact, uh, that's a possibility that I mentioned. And it's an issue of so where you are and how long it takes to go in. That the, in the gas closest, that some of that will almost certainly happen. But you might imagine that there's material that's not close enough to be um, engulfed in the horizon right away. And in that case, well, that they're orbiting. And to go in closer, it must await the usual processes of angular momentum loss. And then there's time to mitigate. And where that division is, is you know, something to be seen by much more detailed calculations. I'm sorry. I was making is that we'll need real thermodynamics, not guess gamma laws. Because if most of the pressure is actually in radiation, 
then you need to know how that radiation diffuses out through the gas. And the effective pressure in that case is largely the photon. or not the case that it's a problem. The two of them is the same issue. So I can imagine a scenario that is fixed and there is a lot of energy trapped in the soul and it could get a bright color mm -hmm. And the neural of them actually processing that first one. That then is just used in the data or we can probably see it. Mm -hmm. And if I can still to go back into the data to transmit it into the disk. So would you agree with that? That there is at least a possibility oh. that if you release a lot of energy, a lot of it goes in the back of it, it just shines yes. anything. It's yes. Fine. So in the, terms of the overall energy cost, you imagine that in the merger proper, this much heat is caused in the gas. Now, what happens to that energy? Some of it, most of it, I think will go very quickly into photons. But if the system is very optically thick, the innermost part may be accreted faster than the inflow time. I'm oh, sorry, may be accreted faster than the cooling time. And in that case, we don't get to see that part of the energy. And that's basically your... I think that's an argument that works for our system to be made at. But you still have solutions that are photon trapping and very bright. Oh, I understand. But, but, but nonetheless, m much of the trapped photon energy goes into the black hole in those solutions. But as long as you can have data, so you have the maps you can get to, you're happy. I, I'm happy with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't care that, about the that might indeed... I mean, what, I'm, what I imagine will happen, and in this case, you know, imagining is probably far from reality, is that it's going to be some combination of these things, where the innermost stuff traps the photons in a solid, stuff that has long enough to cool will radiate and be bright, and the question is how much and which. It's just a quantitative issue of how the energy is shared over these different possible pits. Okay, I think time for only one more question. So, um, I agree completely with you that um, a lot of what is being done is just qualitative and what, whatever is doable and it's just when we put what is transfer that we will be able to fit in some of the big question marks. But I'd like to, to bounce back a question which we have debated yesterday afternoon and that is, do you think we can single out a unique signature of this process, whether on hoot or afterwards, but something that we'll say, oh, this is definitely a binary black hole merger and nothing else can do it. <coughs> I don't know. I'd like to hope so, but I don't think, I don't feel ready to answer that question one way or the other. Right. I'm optimistic enough and I'm willing to put a fair amount of my own research time into it, but <laughs> that's different from saying yes, definitely, and it's this. Okay, thanks again very much.